Got Dan Zangrilli on now to get into it. Dan, I, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Well, Same thing with it. Neil. Let's do it. Uh, first, though, Rowdy Tellez, 529 in June. My man's hitting the ball hard. He's hitting the ball with power. He hit the ball. He flicked one out the opposite way yesterday. It looks like he's seeing it. And you talked to him. I did. And I, I, did you hear any of it? It was pretty interesting. Yeah. And um, I, I wish Doran were here to ask from the athlete's perspective. Uh, but I think we can all apply this to our lives when things aren't necessarily going good for us. Like, how do we get out of it? We, we sort of sometimes just say, and I'm going to use Rowdy Telez's words, screw it. You know, I've hit rock bottom. I'm just going to kind of go out, do my thing, and whatever happens, happens. Almost you're at peace with whatever it is. Because, you can't get worse. Right, and it's out of your hands, so just go be you. And, you know, I asked him, well, who who helped you with this? He, he cites his dad. Uh, his dad was his coach as a, as a little kid. There was another hitting instructor as well over the course of his career and childhood, somebody that actually uh, I think was involved in drafting him with the Blue Jays. And we've learned his name to be D. Brown. So between those two guys, uh, you always got to have your little like Mount Rushmore that you can lean on. And he leaned on those people. And hey, we, we love a good redemption story here in Pittsburgh. We do, but it begs the obvious follow up. I mean, how many times does this need to happen for them? before they start looking in the mirror what they've got going on at the major league level. You know, guys wind up using their own their own coaches. Well, I think that happens more often than you think, and probably in all Across, sports. Across, yeah, okay. In all sports, and in baseball, I think. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily like a dirty secret nowadays. Um, I don't think organizations would prefer that. They'd love to kind of streamline messaging and philosophy, but over the last, I don't know, five, seven, ten years, they've, I think more so rather than tried to fight it. I'm talking like management and major league and minor league coaching staffs. They've just said, well, listen, it's here to stay. We've got to embrace it. And that's, I think, why you you see some of these coaching staffs at the big league level. They're so, so much bigger. You've got the assistant coach and you've got the offensive strategist. I think part of that is maybe dealing with these personal gurus so everybody's sort of on page as they try to streamline it somehow i'm just happy he's turned it around because it seems like come hell or high water they were keeping this guy well and you know that they sometimes the best acquisition you could make is the player that you think you originally acquired or you originally drafted or you've seen in the past rather than trying to upend the apple cart and go bring in somebody else's problem you have plenty of your own. Try to fix your own. That might be the best solution. Do you buy that the Pirates have mismanaged this roster? I mean, when a guy like Ben Heller's up here and he gets shelled against the Dodgers and then maybe no, the just worst. not deep enough. See, that's my thing, man. Like, I don't. Like, they took a flyer on a guy who his last five and two-thirds innings, not a huge sample size of AAA, strikes out 10 dudes, gives up zero earned runs. You're going to throw stuff at the wall and see if it sticks. I'm with you on that. Every series, um, th there's a, a sheet that the Pirates give us. It's the starting lineups, and then it has all the people on the disabled list for one team and all the people on the disabled list for their team. And I always try to look at that just to gain some perspective. I see a lot of words in the Pirates column, huh. and I see a, a handful of words in the Twins column. They've lost three starting pitchers. Four starting pitchers uh, are currently on the injured list. When you consider Oviedo, when you consider Priester, when you consider Gonzalez, when you consider Perez. That had a big trickle down in helping them lose an, uh, that game yesterday because you had to go to a bullpen game in game two. You burned six relievers to get the game two victory. That was great. But you had nobody the following day. They're really missing Dowie Moreta. They're really missing Ryan Barucki. They're not deep enough on their 40-man roster, and that's a process to be able to pluck those guys out of AAA to have them actually be halfway competent they're just taking some stuff guys high upside guys maybe pushing the envelope like with the kyle nicholas who's not quite ready and they're just saying all right throw it up against the wall see what sticks two pieces of criticism that i've seen a ton and i want to know where you come down on it before i give my opinion on this a you have a problem with david bednar going in there when you got a four-run lead mm -hmm. i guess i will give my opinion once he's up and warming up he's up and warming up like, so I actually did not have a problem that they burned David Bednar there. The other one is, should Jared Jones have been pulled after five innings, or should they have left him in there knowing that they had just come off that bullpen game and have him go one more in? Yeah, so that was the rock and a hard place, and Shelton talked about it pregame with, with Joe. Um, you know, they're trying to play the long game with Jared Jones and keep him in play in August. Just the second time this year that he was coming back on four days rest. The other time was the Mets game 
the 50 and 59 pitches that everybody was crazy about. I think they actually threw Jones and pushed the envelope with him more. He threw, I think, 84 yesterday yes. more than they would have liked to because of what you're saying. It's like, we've got nobody. As far as using Bednar, um, the middle game of the series, well, it would be. it's almost we're contradicting ourselves. So you would have not used Bednar, but then brought in some of the bootleggers that we're lamenting about that eventually pitched in game three. Well, gosh, I mean... You had a 4 nothing lead. What if you brought the bootleggers in right. and, and they blew the game? No, I think Shelton has, has played that right. It's there for the taking. Get the win in front I'm of with you. you. And even though, I mean, if you had a deeper bullpen, maybe not. If you could trust somebody else to kind of step up, be the understudy, yeah, a- absolutely you do that. But they don't have that right now. You not were, at all. You were part of the uh, Ben Sherrington long media scrum the other day, and you asked a couple of really good questions my read is they're going to be active as buyers at the deadline if they are in this thing, but I would not be expecting any rentals. And if they are going to sell off assets that they look at in terms of prospects, that they would be getting guys back with some years of control. Yeah, I mean, and that's always going to be the case with a small market team. That's got to be out of the playbook regardless of who the general manager is. It was in the playbook of the previous general managers. So regardless of who's in that chair, that thought process isn't going to change. We're always going to hear rhetoric from Ben Charrington, but we're starting to hear different types yes. of GM speak. And it's more so uh, pointing to the direction that we want to be buyers. And I think he's... Let's compare him to Neil Huntington very quickly. The one big difference, there's a lot of similarities, but the one big difference I think is Ben is less risk averse. He had a quote that I think was really important, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase it here, is we should always be in position to trade minor league players for major league ones. Whereas I'm not necessarily sure Neil Huntington was really as uh, uh, aggressive with that sort of thought process. I think he was a little more conservative where Charrington, I think, will maybe roll the dice a little bit and uh, throw one downfield a little more than the other GMs. Last thing here for you, Dan. Why is that play in the first inning not reviewable? I mean, I, Shelton mentioned it wasn't. I mean, it's just on the list of things that are and aren't. Um, and how they arrive at that, I'm not necessarily sure whether that's a negotiation with the umpires union or what. I'm just speculating. But Why wouldn't umpires want everything to be reviewed? I mean, and, and that's fair. I mean, I, I think they just, you know, for time and, and pace of play, you don't want every challenge for every little thing, and we're just spending the entire game under the hood. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how how do you miss that? I don't know. I don't think that, you know, Shelton couldn't have in an instant thought of, well, let me challenge the hit-by-pitch portion of it. I think he was just hoping that, oh, my gosh, this was so egregious and so obvious that I'm just hoping that if the guy behind the plate didn't see it, we had three other guys who would. I like my chances there. The common sense will prevail that everybody in the stadium, if they saw it, that they too would see it. I think that was his intent. But then once he realized, like, wait, none of you saw it? Then what? I don't think on the spot that you're in a position to scheme. But, yeah, I, I would have loved to see them challenge hit by pitch and let the buffoons in New York actually look at that and then let a run score and go, past ball. Right. Now now they'd have egg on their face. 100%. Put and it there'd in their be lap. more accountability. Yeah, there. onus is on them. Sure. Yeah, I, I do like that. I do like that thought. I mean, none of these guys obviously studied physics. <laughs> I mean, my, like, the thing goes 30 feet the opposite direction. I, that's not going to happen hitting the dude's glove. Yeah, a lot of umpires, and I was told this by a really good umpire, I mean, a lot of times, especially close plays at first base and in uh, situations with stuff like this at the plate, you're calling games more with your ears than you are your eyes because it's like the, the, the theory of have you ever actually seen a hockey puck go into the net? No, it happens so fast, you just see it in the back of the net, and then you, you see the siren. Uh, those, like, foul tips off the glove, did it hit the knob, did it hit the hand? You're using your ears more than you are the eyes. So. If I throw a baseball at your face, it's going to make a different sound, Dan, than if I throw a baseball at a piece of wood. It's absurd, the whole thing. Yeah. And it could have cost them a win, among other things, and I think no it doubt. Did. Yeah. I, think, I think it did. And things are tight. They things, are. Things are quite tight right now. Everybody's bunched in the middle. Mm-hmm. Which lends me to think we're not going to see any moves get made until later in July. I don't know. Um, I actually thought they should have brought Braxton Ashcraft up from Double A. What the hell? I mean, the guy's got stuff. I don't think you necessarily overexpose him in one-inning spurts. He could have been that guy. I, I wouldn't be shocked if they're just trying to 
maybe give them a, an outing or two in AAA and just say, hey, let's 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 try it because y- you can't do any what the hellers anymore. That's for sure. I see what you did there. Wow. Does seem like Martin Perez should be back sooner rather than later. I which think will... next turn in the rotation. Okay, good. They need that. Dan, this was fun. I needed this. Yes. A good chat. We had a lot of fun at the RV. And it's brought to you by Keystone Custom Apparel. Always the pro. Check. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.